Christ. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you today, Lord God. Regardless of what the world throws at us today, Lord God, we ask of you, Lord God, to stay in the court. We ask of you, God, to be our real God. We ask of you, God, to be on our side, whether it be the left or the right level, Lord God. We just ask of you to just to understand that we are weak, yet you are strong. We ask of you, Lord God, to empty ourselves so you can fill us with your Holy Spirit. As I play the background, you bring forth your Holy Spirit to break bread to your people, Lord God. I just ask that anyone here gets touched today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise God, praise God, praise God. Amen. Our scripture for this afternoon is John 10 10. John 10 10. Amen. Amen. The thief comes not but to steal and kill and destroy. I come that I might give you life, mm -hmm. and that they might have life more abundantly. Well. Did you get that? Mm -hmm. Amen. Now, I'm going to let you know right off the bat, this is not going to be your normal Christmas sermon. I would love to preach about love, peace, and happiness and here. That's not going to happen. Amen? I'm compelled to talk about things that is not being talked about in the church. I'm compelled to talk about things that need to be uh, more awakened in the community, more awakened as a group of people, not selective in pockets, as a community, as a whole, as a congregation. And um, I just want people to just help one another, understand one another, know that your flaws can be uh, overcome if I give a testimony to lift you up that you may overcome. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, <clears throat> Many people think that the gospel in and of itself is all about salvation. That Jesus came, Mary gave birth to this Savior, and Jesus taught and gave us all these lessons, and then he died on the cross so that we could all make it to heaven. Sounds nice, but that's not the issue. The issue is if he gives you, if he gives you, you salvation, there's a purpose to your salvation. One of the things I've, I've, I've learned growing up in church is that everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Or nobody wants to die to stand for something. They always want the, the blessings, they always want the benefits, but the thing is, if, he, if Christ died for you, there is something in your life that is valuable. There is something in your life that has something that is fruitful, that needs to block the blossom, that needs to grow. And we as a people, sometimes we get so much in a rut that we think all our trials and all our tribulations that we deserve it. That, that life is just whatever gets thrown at me, I'll just accept it and move on. So I never grow, I never learn, I never excel, I never get anywhere but... I just pray to God, hopefully I'll make it to heaven. But God came and said that he's given life more abundantly. Okay? So, here's the question. If the thief comes to steal, what is he stealing? There's something in your life that is valuable, that has worth to it, that has something that is that's very expensive. And one of the things that we do is that we allow people to manipulate how we should be, or manipulate how our moral standards should be, or manipulate how we should live our own lives, that we never excel, we never get into where we need to be. So what happens is, is that if he's living foul, if she's living foul, and we think that that's the way life is, and though we come to church and we pray and all that, but we have the church is over, we get back to the same rut because we ain't prayed up enough. We ain't helping out each other enough. We ain't giving a good word enough. You come here to get a good word and you go out there, it's like that word is no good anymore. So basically, the word that you hear today, or well, last Sunday, and the Sunday before, and the Sunday before, or some of that came to another church and gave a word to you, that's what's being stolen. That's what's being ripped from you. That's expensive. 
because you can't buy that. Nobody can give you that to uh, that monetary gain. The word is very, very expensive. Amen? Amen. Um, so, the thief comes to kill. He wants to kill your ideas, your dreams, your goals, your inspiration, the words that come out of your mouth that, that has life to it. Those are the things that he wants to kill and steal and destroy. And again, we allow that to happen because if you're not prayed up, you allow you allow the thief to come in and do anything he wants to do in your life. The thief comes in to destroy, to become you become a memory loss. Like your life don't count anymore. Like everything that you've done is not worth it or has any value to you. But again, the word says that Christ came to give life and give life more abundantly to everybody. Amen? Amen. To everybody. So with that being said, I want to talk about Black Lives Matter. It's not very uh, popular in the church. It may be popular in social media. Maybe popular on Facebook and Twitter and all that, but what I, what I what I want to talk about is that everyone counts. And what the, the thing is, it's like things get haywire. People have their own their own input, their own opinion, and the bottom line is is that if black lives don't matter, then the next lives don't matter, then white lives don't matter, then Spanish lives don't matter. How, how long is it going to be until we get to the point where life doesn't even matter anymore? But yet, we get into this argument and this big debate and, and we fight over something when it, the bottom, uh, bottom of, the, of the whole issue is life matters. Regardless of what skin color you are. And, and, and what gets me is that I have white friends, you know, that say, well, I don't understand why there's black pride. Or they'll have like uh, like uh, uh, Black History Month, and, and they have like uh, the Congressional Black Caucus and all that. And it's like I understand that there is no white pride because when white people say it, it seems sound it sounds racist. But when the thing about when, when white people say they don't say white pride, they'll say Irish pride, and they have to, they deserve to say it. Or they'll say Italian pride. You know what I'm saying? So. But we, as black people, when we say black pride or we have black history, it's because we've been so excluded in this country, it's been a while since we, so we have to lift each other up. We have to find each other to understand where we come from, where's our background, where do we relate, how do we go about uh, overcoming this issue, you know, so, and, and this thing is not a black and white issue, it's a black against white supremacy or black against uh, police brutality, when it all should be people in and of itself against evil. People in and of itself against the things that have happened that have of injustice. That's what it should be about. You know, but the media puts a face on it, and it has to be black. And I don't, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm not here to, to be upset or to point fingers or or to downgrade anything like that, but it is what it is. I'm here to just give you the information because, you know, I have white people that are marching right next to me, that are protesting right next, right next to me. So that has nothing to do with it's black or white people. The thing is, it's all about injustice. And what are we going to do as a people are going to do about it? Amen? So, it's all about inclusion. And everybody wants to be included. Had it, think of it this way. Had it not been for black pride, had it not been for black history, had it not been for the things that we try to include in ourselves with uh, the country, I wouldn't even know about my own history. Basically, I would still think about just slavery. My, my, my history would still be in the cotton fields. My history would still be in plantations. My history would be stuck in the 1800s, and I couldn't go further than that. 
I would know how, how to represent my children to be kings and queens, to raise them up in an upright manner, and not just think about civil rights, which was only like 40 or 50 years ago, and then that's it. We can't go any farther. You know, but to, basically slavery is just a speed bump to the history that we had to get to where we are now. And here we are. You know, my child could be a doctor or a lawyer just like anybody else. My child could be the president of the United States like anyone else. You know, because black lives matter. White lives matter. Spanish lives matter. White lives matter. And again, it's all about inclusion. Once you exclude somebody, then it, it no longer becomes a matter anymore. You know, because in, in, in the scheme of all things, even police officers' lives matter. The two, pe the two police officers that got executed, that, that, that was their call for. You know, it, this isn't about like trying to get even or revenge. This is about injustice, what, whatever side it's on. And we don't look at that. We, we got the riots and all that other crazy stuff that's going on. And what Pat and I was talking about yesterday, um, that there was a lady that owned a business, a black lady owned a business, and she had numerous of people working under her. Yet they looted and, and robbed and stole everything on it throughout the whole riot. That in her life still matters. The people that work for her, their life still matters. But we don't we don't think it's close. And this is the problem that we have as a church. Because this, these issues that are going on with um, the Mike Brown, the Troy Barnes, and the Oscar Grant, this ain't nothing but Emma Till all over again. This ain't nothing but the four little girls in Alabama all over again. And the church, right up there, strong, very prominent, in the, it's set in the scene, but we're kind of like lost in the source right now. We're kind of like being quiet about it. It's too political right now. Nobody wants to get their hands dirty right now. Nobody really wants to stand up for nothing right now. We're going to wait till everything settles down, and then we'll, we'll make our presence known. And there lies another problem. Because what happens is, after all the dust settles and everything, the smoke clears, people are going to point at the church and say, well, where was the church when this issue was happening and that issue was happening? And I'm not pointing at the, the, I'm not really pointing the finger down certain individuals. But I can say right now, I haven't heard anything from any televangelists. I haven't heard a peep from any, anybody that has 30 to 40,000 people in their congregation on TV. Because that's where it really matters. They can say something in their own congregation. But now God has given you a stage to be on TV. You need to say something. You know, I, and, and, and again, it, it gets to the point where we need to, we need to educate ourselves. We need to stay in the Word and find out what God wants us to do when we live. Instead of making hasty choices and, and quick decisions. That's what we need to do. What our problem is, is that there's confusion. When, when it comes to Black Lives Matter, there's confusion where people say, well, you still have black on black crime. You still have issues within your own community. But that's apples to oranges. When people go do things, bad things, black on black crime, they go, they get indicted and they go to jail. That's the bottom line. They get indicted and you go to jail. But when injustice happens to stop shooting off our children, our, our uncles, our cousins, our brothers, our sons, and nothing ever happens, now there's a big problem. And, and like the pastor said this morning, just because it's in, in this small area, now, you know, and you say, well, it's not my problem. Well, it escalates because, again, if, if it ain't your son, the next day it will be. If it ain't your, your, your uncle, the next day it will be. Because we think that because our hands are not involved in it, and, and it is in my family, and it has nothing to do with us, that we're not connected to it. Well, enough's enough. And now this has become worldwide. And what gets me, this is what gets me. Is that how many people heard about Ebola? How many people know of somebody that died of Ebola? Wow, no hands. Nobody, nobody knows anybody that died of Ebola? Yeah. Do you know personally, if you know somebody personally that died of Ebola? In this country. Okay. How many?
How many people know about HIV? How many people know somebody that died of HIV? Okay, now you know the difference between the epidemic and a disease, just a normal disease. Now, how many people know somebody that died from police brutality? We, everybody knows somebody that died from police brutality. You see that yeah. news all the time. Yeah. Then we got three, see, between two to three black men that died from police brutality every single week. Now, they're calling Ebola an epidemic, and nobody knows anybody that died from that disease. But yet, we all know police brutality, and somebody's always dying at least three times a week. Three times a week. Now, you tell me the difference between an epidemic and police brutality. And I'll tell you, they're the same. They're exactly the same. And what it what gets me is that the, the news, you got a big distraction. Bill Cosby. The whole situation with Bill Cosby. Kim Kardashian. You got the torture. You got the Cuba. All that stuff that's big, that's what the devil loves to do. He likes to throw distractions so you forget what the main issue is. Who cares what Bill Cosby's done in the past? Has, that doesn't affect me. That has nothing to do with me. The torturing, the Cuba, maybe. But Eric Garner, I have an uncle that looks like Eric Garner. I have a son that looks like Trey Rama. I have a cousin that looks like Oscar Grant. You see the difference? Now it affects me. Now I have to get myself in the mix. Now I have to stand up and say something. And yet, I'm not saying we should get violent and we should stop doing all this, all this crazy stuff, but everybody here, has a voice. Everybody here has a testimony. Everybody here can raise their hands. Everybody here can stand up. Right? But how many people vote? Everybody's hands should be voted. Great. Because here's the, here's, the, the, here's the problem. If you don't vote, then you allow whoever's in there to do anything. They can they have favoritism on the east side. Or they can have favoritism over on the North End. They can do anything they want because you sit on and you let these people do whatever you want. I'm not a politician, but I'll tell you what. Something happens to my family and whoever's the governor, whoever's the mayor, whoever's the senator, they're going to hear my voice. They're going to hear the pastor's voice. Anybody that, anything that happens in my church, somebody gets hurt because of whatever the situation, because you're not, you're not saving my, my, my family. You're not having any inkling of having my, the best interests at heart in my community, and you just let things go by, I have a problem with that. And because of the fact that I have the power to vote, I have the power to have a church to, to say no to, for you to get into the next, the next election, and I'm not pointing the finger at whoever the mayor. I'm just saying, these are probably, you know how they say prayer works? Voting works too. Not as good as prayer, but it still works. And yet, we don't take the initiative to use the powers that we have. We come to church, we get all prayed up, we get all done all, and then two days later, we fizzle out. You know, because we got our own agenda to do and, and things get out of hand, so we don't really focus on what needs to be said. Again, I'm not trying to get everybody all to march, but I want you to stop thinking. That's what I want you to stop thinking, because the, the biggest distraction prevents you from doing what you need to do. And that's to stand up and vote. That's to stand up and say something. You know, you, you have the power, you, you, you have the power to say things to deny the next person coming in, or to shift the change of your own community. You don't want crime in your community? You don't want drugs in your community? You have the power to do that. But again, you settle, or we settle, because I can't isolate you from me. We settle. We're all in this thing. Again, it's an inclusion. That's what this whole thing's all about. Inclusion. Amen? <laughs> so, I know you guys want a, a Christmas set, so I'm going to give you a little Christmas set. <laughs> the problem is with Christmas sermons is that. It's sometimes we get a little fluff, and we all act like kids. Everybody wants something shiny. Everybody wants something that glitters and gold. Everybody wants that pretty basket. 
that's all wrapped up in red and gold and, and, and silver. And once it's open and you stop playing with it, and then you throw it aside. You don't really want to be bothered with it. Right? That's how kids are. You give them a toy, you bet it's in the garbage. You know? So that, that's usually what, how we are, too. Because, again, the gift that we have, half of us don't even open. The gift of love, the gift of peace, the gift of mercy, the gift of grace, the gift of forgiveness. And you know why we want to open it? Because there's a requirement that you have to give it back. And if you have to give it back, it's a bit, very bitter taste in your mouth. Because if, if I open this gift of love, that means I gotta love you too. And me and you might not even like each other, but I still have to love you. Once the box is open, it, 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 you can't like rewrap it, it's open. So we shake the box, we know it's heavy, but we know that there's responsibility to it. We know there's accountability to it, so we don't wanna open it. So we get scared, and then we live our lives every single day, bitter, upset, angry, because every year that box is still under the tree, unopened. So imagine if Darren Wilson opened up his gift, Mike Brown still be alive. The cop that, that chokehold uh, El Donna, he'd still be alive. Maybe he had patience enough not to choke. You know, the cop that shot Oscar Grant in the back while well, his hands were tied behind his back. Imagine if he opened forgiveness. Whoever ticked him off that day, maybe Oscar Grant would be alive. These are the gifts that get us to the point with, of no return. You know, so black lives matter. No life matters. My life matters. This church life matters. And that's all I have to say. Amen. 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 Let us pray.